Well, thank you, Barry, and uh, uh, that was a great introduction, I have to say. Um, I I'm particularly happy to be here today with these two uh, stars because uh, I don't know how much you know, but these are two of the current and future leaders of Hong Kong, and frankly, for me, when they speak, they make a lot of sense. And I might just add that Bernie has a has a, a, a kind of a, a web page type thing that comes out several times a week, and if you haven't gotten to read it, you should because it's his views on a number of subjects. And as you can see, they're very young. They both have genuinely black hair, which uh, which reminds me of an interesting story. And this is a true story that was told to me by the former American ambassador to Beijing. He actually went with uh, Hu Jintao to New York on one of his visits to the United States. And during that visit, they were in New York, and Hu Jintao was at, the, at a suite at the Waldorf Astoria. And he was to meet the governor of New Jersey. And that particular governor was young, but he had prematurely gray hair, sort of like George uh, over here. <laughs> and uh, so when this governor arrived at the... Uh, at the suite, he, he said to the uh, president, President Hu, he said, my God, how do you do it? He said, here I am, you know, a young man, and I've got this gray hair, and you've got this full head of black hair. I'm just amazed. And Hu Jintao said through his interpreter, I'd be glad to share my technology with you. <laughs> <laughs> so Jack, uh, <laughs> okay. But I'm also very pleased to be here among you because I look at the, the members of the Hong Kong Forum as Hong Kong's secret weapon. I'm so glad that it exists because you are the army of supporters of Hong Kong out there in the world. And, and we here in Hong Kong that love this place so much, we do really appreciate the efforts you make to keep Hong Kong prominent on the world stage. So uh, from me, a personal thanks and keep up the good work that you're doing. You know, I, I am, I should state in the front here, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, and I think to be a businessman, you have to be an optimist. And when you talk about Hong Kong, it's very easy to be optimistic because there's so much good in this place and, and so much that's right. And Jack Bates alluded to the media here, and the media does have a, I think they have a DNA of cynicism in there. They, they are cynical about so many things. And I know we call this place Asia's world city, and I thought, that's great, you know, great slogan. And then I saw in some of the media, they're saying, well, this is a trite slogan. It doesn't really mean anything. But the reality is, no matter what you call Hong Kong, it is a, a great place as long as the basics of Hong Kong stay intact. In, in, in uh, recently, one of our, our candidates for um, chief executive, uh, Henry Pang, was giving a talk, I think, to students. And in that talk, he said something about you know, you should aspire to be like Lee Ka Shing. And he got a lot of criticism for this. He, the newspaper said he was on the wrong track, and even today they're still criticizing him for that statement. But the reality is I think the message he was giving um, to the students was that you should strive for success. You know, it's not all about money. I mean, we all like to have financial security. But I think what he was saying is that Hong Kong is a place that allows you to have success and that's the comment he was making, but the media kind of took it out of context as far as I was concerned, and they kind of ripped him apart for that. Because while not everyone can meet the success of Li Ka Shing, this the striving for it results in a lot, of, uh, a lot of success, and not just in business, but in all kinds of fields. And I think this is what Hong Kong has to offer. And when I think about uh, Hong Kong and what it would be like in the future decades, I'm very optimistic because one of the, the main reasons I have this positive feeling is that in the time I've been here, you know, Barry mentioned I came here in 33 years ago, uh, and, and long before that as well, the basic tenets of success for Hong Kong, and you hear them, you're brainwashed all the time about, you know, the taxes and the rule of law and all that. Those basic tenets have not changed. And as long as that remains, I think we have no problem of keeping the Hong Kong that we all know and love so much and that is so successful. And I have to say that no matter who wins the next election among the two key candidates, I don't think there will be any change because I think they both believe uh, that these are the important things that make Hong Kong uh, important. Now, uh, Paul is a very interesting man. He's a member of LegCo, but uh, you know, this is a true success story because uh, I don't know if you mind me mentioning this, but he actually grew up in a, in a squatter hut 
and he came from a very, very poor background uh, as a kid, and now he is not only a successful businessman, but a member of LegCo, and I think that's the Hong Kong story of people who, who have nothing, they came across the border, many swam, and they've had, uh, they've had success. And I think this is, this is what keeps me inspired, and I don't think any of that, any of that is leaving at all. And I have to say that, uh, you know, we sometimes think when, when the handover took place, or many of us wondered what would China change about Hong Kong? What might they deteriorate or even destroy? And they haven't done anything to deteriorate the basics of Hong Kong. They've let Hong Kong people run this place as, as it's always been run. And I think that is, uh, that is an amazing thing. One of the issues that we hear a lot about uh, is democracy and, and obviously we don't have total democracy but we do have some and uh, it was very interesting because we I don't know how much you keep up with it but we recently had a what we call the district council elections which cover all of Hong Kong and uh, in my view that was total democracy I mean everybody you know the, the grassroots people got to vote for their local representatives in the districts and it was interesting because the results of that election the, the, the main democracy advocates, can I say they got defeated? They did. I mean, the, ma the major parties who were pushing it, uh, you know, did not do well in these elections for the most part. And I think this was the Hong Kong people speaking. In many ways they were saying, I like the system. I don't want radical change. Not that they're, not, not that they're opposed to democracy, but through that voice they said, I think Hong Kong runs well and I'm satisfied with what the government's doing. We do have a day here now, if you're ever here on July 4th, 1st, uh, this is our day uh, for everybody who's pissed off about something to come out and march on the streets and it, used to, it started with one issue and now it's every issue you can imagine from, from dogs to gays to any, everything else and, and it's quite an interesting day, it's almost like a festival. But that's the way we do things in Hong Kong. The, the second thing I'd say about Hong Kong that hasn't changed and what I feel so strongly about is, is the adaptability of the Hong Kong people. Uh, you know, Jack, when he gave his comments earlier, talked about the transition that Hong Kong has seen from manufacturing up to today's uh, service economy. And that is, that is totally true. All those manufacturing jobs when I got here in 78 are gone. And it hasn't been that long. It's been three decades. And yet we have adapted, the people of Hong Kong have adapted to the new Hong Kong without any major fluctuations. Today we have 3.3, I think it's 3.3% unemployment. So all those people who were working on assembly lines learn new trades or their children were educated to take professions. And that is what is so inspiring about this place. We adapt. We don't sit around and complain and ask the government to help us for every little thing. We adapt to the new, new realities of what Hong Kong is about, and we get on with it. Now, I guess I should talk a little bit about business. As Barry said, uh, I started my company in Japan in 65, but we opened here in Hong Kong in 1970. And for a while, I just, tra I just traveled down here. I didn't live here until 78. But the more I came down in the 70s and I compared Japan, which, was, which is a fairly rigid place, uh, to our Japanese friends here, there's no, nothing wrong with that. But uh, comparing it to Hong Kong, which was this wide open, flexible place, I realized quickly that this should be the place we should headquarter our company. There was so many other advantages, but just the ease of, of all aspects of doing business made this the, the ideal choice. And as the company grew initially around Asia and later around the world, there has never been any, any uh, uh, cause for me to ever want to change the, the headquarters of the business from Hong Kong. And a matter of fact, I'm amazed that more companies don't headquarter their business here. But in reality, as we went out into the world, and there were other na nations would have things like, like the TDC or Invest Hong Kong, and you know, they'd say, come here and invest. Then we'd find high taxes, we'd find bureaucracy, we'd find corruption, and we never found any place in the world that was better to operate a business from than he right here in Hong Kong. And Barry mentioned the example of wine, and it is kind of, kind of funny in a way that from that day and that wonderful Hong Kong Forum luncheon when uh, I think Henry had the thought in mind before I brought it up, by the way. <laughs> but having taken that tax off wine, 
has turned the industry, turned the wine segment, the wine industry of Hong Kong into something very big. And it was almost as if the Hong Kong government was acting entrepreneurially. They said, okay, we're going to invest the tax revenue, which wasn't much. It was about 700 million Hong Kong dollars. We're going to invest that into the idea of developing Hong Kong as the wine center of Asia. And that has cre created so much activity, so many jobs, and, and so much other, in, uh, I should say, influence of the, the wine industry in Hong Kong that all of the people come here now from all over the world. As a matter of fact, we had a, a fellow from Bordeaux, a winemaker from Bordeaux at our, our facility at our wine cellar the other day, and he said, uh, you know, I see my friends from Bordeaux more in Hong Kong than I see them in Bordeaux because everybody's coming out to this part of the world. And I think that is the way Hong Kong works. It's a fantastic example. Uh, the cultural aspects of Hong Kong are, are rapidly becoming part of the fabric. I think for any international world city, we have all the aspects, but the soft side of culture uh, is now developing. We will one day, I hope in my lifetime, have uh, the Hong Kong Kowloon Cultural Center completed. But in the meantime, galleries, art galleries, and other things are popping up here on a very regular basis. And so that aspect is coming in uh, into Hong Kong. And I think that will be one of the final dimensions that will truly make this an amazing place. And as Bernie mentioned, and it's his sort of major role now, is the respect for heritage here. And uh, personally, I'm, I'm a great, um, I love history, so I hate to see things destroyed that really do tell a story about Hong Kong. And I realize all the complications that are, are faced in this situation, but the reality is we must have some element of cur uh, heritage because, as he said, people are no, looking, no longer looking at this as a transient place. They're looking at it as their home, and they want to have a little bit of the history of that here. Uh, the current situation, uh, I think that you all know that the world, the world, the places that you live, are all turning to this part of the world more than they ever have before. Being in the moving business, I can tell you that the global mobility trend is definitely this way. Uh, Hong Kong being one of the greatest recipients of it. Uh, there are some issues with that because we are getting a little crowded and the schools are, are pretty full and whatever, but, and houses, house prices are going up. But there's no question that people are saying there's problems in North America, there's problems in Europe, and the opportunities are here. And it's not, we find that in the financial world, many of these organizations, these well-known financial companies, uh, our firms, are sending their top people here, their, their most senior people to Hong Kong. That's pretty impressive. But in addition, we're seeing an awful lot of young people who are looking for opportunities that they're not finding back at home to come here and to, uh, to really see if they can make their way, as I did, in this, in this vibrant part of the world. And I think there are plenty of opportunities. Uh, we, are, um, uh, we, we are pretty much equipped to take as much as we can. We have to solve these problems of housing and schools. But Hong Kong has always been this laissez-faire type place where things adjust due to supply and demand. And maybe we're going to go through a, a softening period in the coming year. I think the unquestionably prices will start to adjust downward. Maybe difficult for some industries, but favorable for a lot of other people. So I think that's going to work out very well. Everyone uh, is interested in the development of China. Uh, and it's been talked about, and Paul gave an excellent presentation on that just now. But uh, I have to say that Hong Kong has really benefited from our relation with China uh, throughout, this, throughout the decade of the 2000s because uh, they helped us during SARS, and they continue to help us both in the retail. They, they come here and they spend their money in our hotels and our restaurants and our retail and an ocean park and all these kind of places. But they're also helping by investing their business, listing their companies here, and uh, doing so many things to support uh, Hong Kong. They do drive our property prices up, which is something the government has to deal with, and they are, I think they are dealing with it uh, to some extent. But on net basis, uh, the mainland Chinese have really, really helped uh, Hong Kong stay vibrant. And I don't see that changing. I think the the people from the mainland really do see some attraction in Hong Kong, whether it's to visit here, whether it's to invest here, or whether it's to live here, if that would be possible for them to do. And so I think that, that bodes well for Hong Kong for the future. 
And conversely, I think that Hong Kong people, more than most, have really benefited from taking advantage of the uh, opportunities in China. I, and again, I, I, I kind of relate to something that Bernie said, and that is that one of the strongest assets of those of us who live here in Hong Kong is what we have learned, the experience we've gained over the last 30 years of how to do business in China. That is an intangible asset, but I can tell you, and it's, it's a lot of it's been learned the hard way, I have to say, but it's an intangible asset that we have in this city that I think is stronger than just about anywhere else in the world in terms of how to do business there, whether it be for ourselves or whether it be for visiting international companies. So I think that is a, an underlying strength that we have, and the opportunities to continue to do things there will be uh, absolutely uh, amazing. So I, I'll just leave it at that. I'm very um, positive and optimistic by nature, but I'm also, I think there's good reason to be about the, con the way the Far East stands today, the way Hong Kong stands today, and the opportunities for all the companies that your countries represent. So I think this is a good message to take back. There's good news in the Far East, so continue to bring your companies to invest out here. So thank you very much.